You know, I'm one of those guys that when you say, do you have a favorite Bible passage? I say, oh, yes. And I usually have about 29 of them. And there's one that we've been talking about this season a little bit. It's Luke chapter 1, 77, 79. And I, I just want to go back to it tonight. It's, it's a neat passage because when it's talking about the ministry that, that God is bringing to us, it's to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. I think few places in the scriptures so clearly define what Christmas is all about. Aren't you supposed to be seen on that side? Okay. All right. All right. In fact, the entire Christian message is, is summed up in, in these three short statements. The knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of God. The knowledge of salvation. The great philosopher Socrates, what was that, 3,000 years ago, stated, Oh, that someone would arise, man or God, to show us God. This has been the longing of humanity since the beginning of time. It's then spent our quest to find God. Philosophers, scholars, musicians, students, even the common man has undertaken this search for God. I remember being at a party one time and I run into a guy that sells industrial parts. And he finds out that I'm a pastor. And he unlays before me the most elaborate plan of God and the world and the universe that I'd ever heard before. Um, obviously, he'd been thinking about how it all works. And, 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 you know, whether it's street people, whether it's primitive tribes that anthropologists find, the intellectuals in academia, everybody's trying to understand life's purpose. And, and the big question is, is there a God? And I have to say, it's easy to get sidetracked. Uh, this scientist who received the Pulitzer Prize for, for uh, discovering the Geno Code, smartest guy around, right? Well, his opinion about our existence is aliens laid spores upon the earth, which led to our civilization. Okay? Thinking, wow, how can you be so smart and so dumb? Um... It's an intense search. Why? See, we're hoping that life has meaning. We're hoping that there's a God because otherwise war and famine and disease and all the destructive angles of life that get tossed in our world, um, they just have the last word and, and we're hoping that that doesn't have the last word. But we want to be saved from these evils. We're hoping for not only a better life on earth, we're hoping for a better eternity. You know, ancient map makers, when they would come to the boundaries of the known world, they would write on the corner of the map, beyond here there be dragons. And at Christmas, God has come to explain how to make sense out of this world and those unknown aspects that have scared us, such as death. Uh, Hebrews 2.15 states, He has come to deliver us who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all our lives. You and I don't have to fear death anymore. In fact, I was with somebody tonight, and they were talking about their father, who was all fighting for life, and he says, I don't understand why he's fighting for life. He's a Christian. He believes in eternal life. Why doesn't he just let go and be with God? And his wife said, because he wants to stay here and complain about things. Okay. <laughs> But you and I don't have to fear death. We understand it's the transition to eternal life. Now, there are misconceptions about eternity. For many, salvation is something that awaits us in the next life. But, but salvation is more than a get into heaven card. And yes, I'm saying that the benefits of being a Christian are out of this world. But God's gift of salvation 
It's available now. Do you realize that, that uh, studies have been done and, and they've come to the conclusion that churchgoers live longer than non-churchgoers? Did you know that? So coming to church, you're extending your life. Because that means you're not at the bar, smoking and drinking, hanging out with bad people. You're here with us. Who don't do the smoking and drinking part. Um, I guess I want you to know that, that we can be rescued, though, from, from the negative effects of life. Uh, and, and, and here's where it's kind of powerful. Christ has come to defeat the sin that hinders us from enjoying life. And as soon as I say defeat sin, uh, somebody's hand goes up. Well, then why is there still sin wreaking havoc in the world? Why does sin still dominate us? And I know all of us can relate to the Apostle Paul's words, I do not do the things I wish to do, I do the things I wish I didn't do. That's the power of sin that, has, that it has over us. You see, the sin within us, it's something that humanism, good deeds for our fellow human, or, or intellectual advancements don't eradicate. So how do we get rid of sin? It's when we engage in the ongoing process of inviting Jesus into our thinking processes, our decision-making, and our behavior choices. This is where the sin battle is won. When you and I do life with God, that's when sin starts to lose its grip upon us and we start enjoying salvation. Just as a baby is born and then grows, when we invite Jesus into our hearts and he's born within us, then he grows according to how much we feed him. And if we feed our faith, Jesus grows to maturity and you get transformed. Sin gets diminished. You see, Christianity, it's not about being good people, okay? Our faith is not a moral code. It's, it's, it's responding to life with God. It's touching broken people with His love. And friends, this occurs when the Holy Spirit is influencing us. I want you to realize something. When Jesus came to earth, He was called God with us. And then when He went to the cross to take care of sin, He made sure that God was still with us by leading the Holy Spirit so that we're never without the presence of God. Do you see the gift that Jesus has brought to us? When he says God with us, it was through him and then now the spirit and that spirit's the one that's working inside of us. That brings the knowledge of salvation. The next thing, the forgiveness of sins. A child wrote a letter to Santa that read, Dear Santa, in my house live three children, Jeffrey who was three, Tommy who was five, and Norman who was seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time. Tommy is good most of the time. Norman is good all of the time. My name is Norman. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to be good all of the time. Um, A good day is 70%, right? Uh, We do our best. Somebody offends us. We get angry. Our thoughts go wandering where they shouldn't be. We get selfish. We miss opportunities to be a blessing. And we think, oh, well, whatever. But it's it's not whatever. It's called sin. And the problem with sin is it's a violation of God's law. And and this whole idea of being accountable to God, the creator, it's nonsense to the postmodern mind. I was watching a documentary, uh, and the scholar referred to Eve when she ate the forbidden fruit as the liberator of humanity crediting her with the the giver of knowledge. Well, I don't know. Things were good. She tricked Adam by chopping up the fruit and put it in the fruit salad. And then look what happened. You know, today we tend to minimize sin as merely missing our human potential. But have you noticed that the more advanced we get, It doesn't seem to remove sin from the equation. Selfishness and domination of other, that remains the norm for humans. And God came to us in Jesus Christ because he wants us to know the truth about ourselves, that we have a sin problem. 
And trying to live without him only leads to more destruction of the self and others. And I think it's challenging, human wisdom versus God's ways. You know, God operates differently. Um, impregnating a virgin. Being born in a barn, not a palace. A kingdom of love rather than military might. Turning the other cheek and forgiving people who hurt you. I mean, this isn't the way the world handles situations. But it's God's formula for happiness. I mean, let's be honest. When you've chosen to respond with grace towards somebody, isn't that a much more fulfilling feeling than getting one over on them or getting even with them? I mean, there's just not the same experience. There's a peace that seems to emanate around us when we handle it God's way. And God wants us to know his ways because, well, his ways reveal his character. And God is forgiving. I like how he introduced himself to Moses in Exodus 34. The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin. This is God's self-introduction. And forgiveness is the central theme of, of Christianity. It, again, it, it defies our natural inclination. Okay? It doesn't make sense that we can break God's laws and still be offered unhindered access to His presence. And I want you to understand something. When we say, Lord, forgive me. Okay? It's more than a pronouncement of pardon that we seek. It's an inner renewal it's an invitation to a new you. It's a never-ending second chance to be right with God, to be released of sin, and to have His Spirit, His Word, His way, His presence remold and shape us. And you have to know that forgiveness, it doesn't only rectify our relationship with God. Okay? It, it, it changes the relationships around us. I'm sure many of you have difficult people in your life. Maybe at work. Don't say anything, Cheryl, George. Okay, it's not for you. Okay. But uh, you know, there's a story of Leon, Leonardo da Vinci. He's doing the Last Supper, and he paints one of his enemies' faces on Judas. Okay. Yeah. And then he goes on to finish the painting, and he comes to the face of Jesus. And he just can't seem to get it right until he goes and repaints Judas' face. And then all of a sudden he was able to paint Jesus' face. See, it wasn't until he engaged in God's forgiveness that the masterpiece was complete. And, and by the way, God remembers your sins no more. And this is huge, because how many of us remember our sins from yesterday and yesteryear? Or yester decade. Okay? We don't forgive ourselves. And God, he, he's already forgotten about it. He's already moved on. You know, a man went for counseling because his wife and he were fighting all the time. And he told the counselor, you know, every time we get in an argument, she, she gets so historical. The therapist said, you mean hysterical? He said, no. I mean, she always drags up the past. And you and I, we have a clean slate every time we fail. Okay? Why? Because God's interested in your future more than he is in your past. Think about that. God is interested in your tomorrow and where you're going to be in three months and the rest of the trajectory of your life. You think, oh, this is it. Actually, he has somebody in mind for you. He has restoration in store. He's planning on uprooting those inner demons that keep us immature and hurting and broken. Why? Well, look at it from God's perspective. You are his precious creation. You were made in his image. I mean, what, what effort would you go to restore something to you? Let, let's say you lent the neighbor a tool. Yeah, you might go get it when you need it, right? 
Or the, the, the dog runs away. You're going to put up signs. You're going to look at the dog pounds. But when your child goes astray, I mean, don't you go to every extent to try to go find them and restore them back to you? You know, Tony Campolo, he's, he was an evangelist, and he was in Newcastle, England, to do an evangelistic meeting. And, and Newcastle, it's a wild English town. You've got pub scenes and all the young people in the dead of winter, the short skirts, and, you know, showing their legs and shoulders, and the guys out there trying to make their moves. And Tony goes out into the night under the guise of being a sociologist, okay? And, and he goes to this one particular nightclub, and he sat in the corner, and, and in the midst of the loud music and the strobe lights, he sees this guy sitting in the corner who's an older man in a tweed jacket, obviously out of place, definitely establishment-looking and conservative. And so Tony goes, what are you doing here? And the guy says, well, about a month and a half ago, my son ran away from home. And he's into this lifestyle, and he comes to places like this. So tonight I thought I'd come and sit here and look for him, and if he showed up, I wanted to tell him that I love him, and I want him to come home. And so it is with God. You know, we've run off to do our own thing, and we disobey him, we break his heart, but just like the prodigal son story, even though the son says, I I can't wait for you to die, I want to do life without you, the father waited, stared out the windows, out into the distance looking for his son and ran to meet him when the son was finally coming back his way. Why this unconditional commitment? Because of the tender mercy of God. You know, a politician was reviewing the proofs of his portrait and he was angry with the photographer. He says, this picture doesn't do me justice. The photographer said, sir, with a face like yours, you don't need justice, you need mercy. And God's forgiveness is based on mercy. You see, mercy is probably the most accurate description of the character of God. It's the deep, tender feeling of compassion that is awakened by the trouble and suffering of those in need. In other words, when God sees us hurting and being affected by sin, his heart gets troubled and his emotions get moved. But for God, it's not just emotions. His his mercies manifested into action. He saw us in our helpless condition, trapped and doomed by sin, and he personally came to do something about it. You know, there's a story of an African boy who was taught why we give gifts at Christmas. And so when Christmas Day came, the boy brought his teacher a, a seashell from 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 the ocean. Uh, it was a beautiful shell. And she said, well, where did you get this amazing seashell? And you said, at the ocean. She goes, but the ocean, it's just a long ways away. And he said, yes, long walk, part of the gift. And, and I like this because it's kind of like Christ's gift to us. He forfeited his deity at Christmas time, willing to be murdered on a cross, all to bring us God's mercy. The distance of heaven to earth he came to find you and to release you of sin and give you abundant life, eternal life, life with God. You know, life with God, this isn't a human idea. No, it's the work of the infinite, almighty, tender-hearted God. He forgives us daily. He seeks to be close to us. He never washes his hands of us. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. Well, let me wrap this message up. A child wrote a letter to Santa. Dear Santa, last year you did not bring me anything good. The year before, you didn't bring me anything good either. This is your last chance. (laughs) How about this Christmas? God's actually giving us another chance to experience his goodness and love. I don't want you to go through another year. I don't even want you to go through another day without the love of God. 
defining your identity, giving you a new attitude and a new approach to life. That you would be close to this tender-hearted, almighty God who's passionately in love with you. Friends, this is the Christmas invitation. Amen?